So this part is a founder panel, and we're going to be hearing from Jeffrey Sutich and Joe Luby and Warren Rapp. Oh, hello. Okay. Good. Looks like all three gentlemen are present now. So let me tell you a little bit about their backgrounds. Jeffrey Sutich is currently the Executive Director of Northern Nevada Development Authority and has been supporting economic development and global trade in Nevada for over 12 years. As an entrepreneur, Jeff competed in the Governor's Cup Business Plan Competition at UNR during his MBA program and won Jumpstart Cash to create an online custom suit business, oddly called Suit It. That's really cute. Uh, since then, Jeff has launched two more businesses, Dine by Design with Peak Meek Luxury Picnics and Telio, a tech app connecting experts to consumers. So we'll want to hear a little bit more about that. And he's in the process of helping his family ranch launch an agritourism business. Joe Luby retired from 20 years in a suit and tie doing financial and tax planning. He and his wife, Lauren, co-founded Two Rich Bourbon in 2016. The brand is named for their sister Doberman rescue dogs, and the company is based in Eureka. Warren Rapp, Lieutenant Colonel Warren Bumrap, is a native Nevadan who was raised in Reno and served in the military as a pilot for 27 years. He has a very diversified background in startups and entrepreneurship and is currently one of the founders of Nevada Technology Corporation, which opened up this past summer. So, all right. So Jeff, Jeff has been part of Launch World Nevada for a couple of years. He came in as one of our sponsors in the first year with Nevada Energy, and then he moved on to economic development, helping more people at NMDA. So I'm surprised that you're able to do that and all of the startups that you have. Which one is? Are they all still in business? Yes. So, Really, custom suits, that's very good. Um, the Governor's Cut Business Plan is no longer part of the UNR, UNR program, and that's a shame, it was a wonderful program. Joe, you, you and your wife started Two Bitch Bourbon. I read your website, and this is a tragic story. Can you tell us a story about uh, what happened when your fiance at the time was off and you were taking care of another dog? Yeah, she. Uh, I like to let her tell this story. It's, uh, but I'll, I'll give you the quick version because it gets me in less trouble. But uh, she had gone off for her bachelorette to uh, get together with her family out of state. And I had my old dog and her dog that was 10 years old. And I took them on a fishing trip up to Sunnyside, just north of Alamo and Ash Springs. And her dog ran off after a jackrabbit into the sagebrush and never came back. And I spent, my, my friends were there and we spent, you know, countless hours searching, searching, searching. And I had to make that fateful call and tell Lauren, oh, by the way, I just lost your baby, you know, your 10 year pup. And uh, um, she flew back early and we went out and spent days and days looking for that dog, put flyers up everywhere, you name it, we did it. And, uh, but anyway, about three months later, she did still marry me, although that was touch and go for that three month period. <laughs> I can imagine. I'm surprised she married you. And yet now you're in business together. Yeah. So, so that, what is that the dog part? loss, or, or I'm sorry, I was going to say that dog loss led us to adopting the two dogs that uh, became the two bitches behind the brand. So that's sort of the impetus for where we got the new dogs. That's great. Wait, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, it looks like we're going to be able to hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we do. Okay. Okay. I'm going to ask a follow on question to Joe, though. So, okay. Joe, what's the hardest part about being in business with your wife? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> let me tell you. No, uh, actually, we, we happen to work very well together, but there can be those days where you're just not on the same wavelength for whatever reason, just like what happened in any normal, you know, couple. And uh, it does exacerbate things a little bit when you know, the other half of the company is not talking to you uh, for the, you know, for the day. That gets a little rough on making progress on whatever the projects were for the day, but luckily that's pretty rare. We, we happen to work together very well. Do you have a good division of responsibilities? 
we do very much so. So Lauren handles all of our graphic design work. She's an artist. She does all of our graphics, all of our photographs, all of our imagery, all of our social media. So basically anything under the marketing heading is <laughs> definitely on her plate. And I am the business side. I do all the finance stuff, um, uh, manage the production and all that, that kind of um, activity. So we do have some very defined lines. And then there's always crossover where, you know, we get together and agree on certain things in terms of, you know, what state are we going to go after next or whatever. But yes, we do, we do break it up. All right. Now, Lieutenant Colonel, welcome. Glad we can hear you now. Um, you're with a company that just started earlier this year, and you have how many co-founders? Uh, four co-founders. And your business is doing recycling of battery. Well, why don't you tell us what your business does? Okay. So um, we are aligned with a company in India called Loam, which is their leading uh, battery recycler for their country. And so uh, just through a series of meetings, we met up with some of their senior leadership. Uh, we were all previously with another company in Nevada and that was not going in the same direction we wanted it to go in. So uh, one thing led to another, they offered to fund us uh, and we decided to go into business with them. And so uh, we are going to be their, uh, I guess you call it US arm of their company starting even though we're independent but we have uh, IP rights to utilize their recycling methodologies. And then in addition to that, with our uh, set of skills that we had in, internal and with the founders, we're also going to pursue battery development, not as much as on the research side as we are combining technologies that we know are gonna work uh, with other people that have kind of inked out the bugs and those certain specific types of lithium ion, lithium sulfur and other types of technologies. And where's so, the yes. company based? Well, right now we are, it's funny you say that, we're in Carson City in an office uh, uh, just temporarily, but uh, this morning before I came onto this call, I, we were actually looking at properties in Reno. Um, and we also, uh, in, an, in conjunction with that, we have a branch that could be out in uh, Indiana right now uh, uh, and also Saudi Arabia. They have also reached out to us for recycling needs, so. So will you be doing the recycling here in Nevada? Eventually, yeah. It's it's not an easy process to set up. It's about a two-year jaunt to find the right facility, to get all the environmental permitting and all the infrastructure logistically to be able to pick up, you know, what we call feedstock, other people's batteries, bring them in, recycle them. And, and the good news about us, everyone's heard of Redwood, uh, which they're an amazing, you know, recycling company from where they weren't three years ago and where they're at now and the money they've raised. Uh, but we do something that we don't do incineration to separate our materials. So ours is more environmentally friendly in that it's water-based and liquid-based. Um, and so it's cheaper to do it that way. We can actually extract a lot more uh, components of a battery uh, doing that methodology. And, and certainly the environmental carbon footprint is much less. Okay, so when do you think you'll be able to actually recycle your first battery? Well, our hope is by um, the end of 2025, we will be in what we, you know, we'll have pilot type uh, programs. We just still have to learn some of the methodologies, but by the end of 2025, we're hoping to be in, in a relative, you know, um, full scale operation at that point. And how many employees do you think you'll have at that time? Uh, with a full up recycling plant, probably between 200 and 250 employees. That's great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Okay, um, Jeff, how are you doing? <laughs> Good. Now, you've started three businesses. Is your family involved in those at all? My wife is in, in charge of the luxury picnic business. That was uh, created during the pandemic when uh, she, after kid number two, she decided to be a stay-at-home mama from a teacher. And then she's very creative. And so asked me to create this type of business for her. So she does all the, the work on that one. I can. I can just carry things real well. Um, but so that one we do together. And then the other two businesses, I have partners that I work with. Okay, wonderful. Um, how do you think that having been in business and started several of them, how does that inform the way that you approach economic development for NNDA? So it was kind of reverse. Most of my career, I was 
teaching companies how to export, uh, take them overseas to meet buyers, to help guide them through the economic business development process. But it was all theory that I had learned in school or or from my uh, former mentors and bosses. And so that's kind of what got me going to, okay, well, I keep teaching people how to do this, but is it what happens if I try it myself? So it was kind of the reverse of, okay, I better do it myself and see if it works and if it's true. And then through that, I learned some certain areas were yes, true in some senses, but not in others. And so it's helped, helped mold me better to be a better um, guide, I guess you could say, through my uh, regular career process. So what would you say was the most surprising thing that you learned that differed from what you taught? Good question. Um, I would say on the export side of things, uh, for the suit business, we we are importing uh, products, uh, the materials for those suits, and and the the typically you go okay, you need to diversify your your revenue stream. So everybody should export. You need to get into as many markets as you can as your uh, production allows to then if something bad happens in your current market or a different market, there's another revenue stream that comes in to help keep you afloat. Well, it's a lot easier said than done. Finding the right suppliers, the right partners, uh, the different country market regulations, the tariffs, the the different harmonized codes that you need to know to get a different tariff. It's a lot harder to get that figured out and then to make sure that supplier stays up to 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 date with the quality and and so I would say telling companies yeah just do it and and figure it out was probably more of a mislead than actually doing it it's like no you do need to have the bandwidth and the time to do that research to meet those suppliers to ensure that, that it's a good product test it out make sure it stays that way and then try to scale it up as your bandwidth allows and as your production allows and so would you say that you now have a formula to advise other founders wait until this point in your sales journey or in your manufacturing process before you even try to export? Uh, not really. I think um, hitting economies of scale is really important to lower your costs. And if you have the bandwidth to do the research, start looking at other markets and see what they look like. If you can, if you're selling a, a tomato here in, in Nevada and you're making a dollar off of it, if you can sell that tomato after expenses for $10 in Singapore, go for it, but make sure you have the ability to do it and the bandwidth to do it and make sure you get that figured out first before going into multiple markets at the same time. Same thing as going to, you know, you know your local and you want to go to your region and you want to, then you want to go national, uh, do it all at the same time. So where's the best market for you? Make sure you do that due diligence. Yeah, there's a lot of market research that should go into picking your secondary, tertiary, and, and your markets beyond that. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, where are you distributing now? So we are in. Uh, we're able to be bought on the shelf in Nevada, Arizona, uh, Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, Illinois, and Florida. And I believe I've got that right. And then uh, we on our website we've. Uh, something relatively new in the spirits business. There are companies that you can partner with that uh, will host online sales, online bottle sales uh, via our own website. So the, to the customer, it's a it's a two bitch bourbon experience. It's branded, you know, on our on our own site and everything. But technically, when they buy a bottle online, their the transaction is actually through a legal liquor retailer based in California because our licensing doesn't allow us to sell to the general public. We can only sell wholesale to liquor stores and, and bars and restaurants. But that new opportunity to be able to sell online like that to the individual consumer using that third party partner has let us ship to, I believe it's 32 states now that we can cover, you know, if people just order individually and it gets delivered right to their door, which has been fantastic. So for you, does that mean it's like you're only selling to California and they're a reseller? Or do you have to worry about regulations in every single state where somebody's trying to buy your product? So in that particular relationship, we only have to deal with that one company in California 
and and they actually have a, a warehouse on the other side of the country as well. So we ship to both of those locations, um, but it's all wholesale to them. And then they have to worry about the individual state regulations on their end, because technically they are the uh, company that the customer is buying the bottle from, even though, again, the online transaction looks and feels like they're doing business directly with us. Um, but technically, when their credit card is charged, it's a third party. So they that third party has to deal with all the state level regs. So have any of you guys gone out for venture capital or angel investment? I'll take you one at a time. How about Jeffrey for any of your three businesses? Not yet, but we're about to do that on the, the tech company. Um, the other ones has all just been through our own financing, just from ourselves. And, and we thought about doing that this time around, but since I haven't gone through that process, uh, I've convinced my partners that let's, Let's keep our capital on the side in case we need it, but let's experience that and see what that process looks like. So not quite yet, but we're we're gearing up for it. How about you, Joe? Um, we have not to date. Um, it's all been uh, in-house, internal. Um, we have not brought in outside investors, but I would maybe echo a little bit of what Jeff said. I It's possible down the road. I'd never say never. But at the moment, we have not. Um, We've been able to, right. to and, do it in-house. And, and Warren, you're part of an Indian company, so you're in kind of a different situation to begin with. Well, that's, you know, yes and no. Uh, we are going out of venture capitalists right now. And so when I've done that before, even when I worked at UNR, the director of the Autonomous System Center. So I dealt with the Sierra Angels and some of the other, um, as you could call them, investors uh, in Northern Nevada. So... Um, I can tell you, if you're going to do a startup, when you bite off a, a uh, energy-based uh, startup, it, there's a lot of money involved to get this going. And so our seed money alone is probably around $7.5 million. We've got about $4.5 million already, and we're working on the other $3 million right now. And then actually stand up our uh, plants, our recycling plants, are going to be about $185 million. So it's just, it's not a cheap venture to go into, and you definitely um, have to have your you-know-what in, in the basket before you reach out because you get asked all those questions that venture capitalists ask you. So, Well, there should be grant money available for your business as well. There is. There is grant money. Through, as a matter of fact, the, the company I worked with before, uh, I was managing a, a grant with the Department of Energy, and that was a startup company as well. And so we were able to write that and, and we got about a four and a half million dollar grant from them, which, you know, it paid the bills, but it wasn't much more just because, again, batteries and energy, it's very expensive. Yeah. So, Jeff, what are you doing to prepare to go out for investment? I've researched, um, I think we've got about close to 40 VCs that are within our realm. They're that capital is getting difficult right now. So we're aware of that, but I, we want to find a partner that not only can provide funds to get us to the next level, but has that expertise. So the initial step is finding those VCs that can provide both of those. And then when we're ready to go, uh, pitch them and see if they'll talk to us and then have that dialogue to see if it's a fit or not. So I meant to ask you, what is the tech company doing? It says it's connecting experts to consumers, but in what realm? So it's an it's an app. So there's there's an app for iOS and one for Android, and then we have a website. So you can use either of those platforms to connect. And the idea is is basically everybody is a consumer, but everybody is an expert in something. So why not take your expertise and put it on a platform to monetize your time and for the expertise that you've spent uh, so long coming up with. So if you're uh, an expert in, in financial advice or a mechanic or a tennis coach or a musician, a, a veterinarian, sky's the limit, you can go onto this platform and connect with consumers. Then the consumer that has the need to, for a question to be answered fast can then reach out to that expert and the expert will charge by the minute for their time. Our platform takes a percentage of that transaction fee and then the, the expert gets the funds, the consumer gets their question answered fast. Okay, thank you. Um, our last question, and I will pose it to each of you. Uh, 
As a founder, how do you balance work life and personal life, especially for those of you who are doing it with family? And Warren, you're going to be making a new family with this business. Why don't you answer first? I'm going to have to replace my current family with that. So uh, no, I say that jokingly. <coughs> um, you know, I, coming from 27 years in the military where we were also very busy and, and uh, much of our time was taken, as a commander, I always told the folks that I was commanding over was, you have to have balance in your life. It is absolute. Um, and the startup industry is no different. You are going to be working, you know, a, a startup that's successful, especially in the phase that I think a few of us are in right now, um, your, your time is precious, but you're not a nine to five business. You are uh, 24, seven, seven days a week. Cause you kind of have to be initially. That doesn't mean though that you still can't plan time to balance with your family. Because if you don't, uh, it's noticeable on people who don't. And they basically look like they've been put through the ringer when you try to talk to them every morning. And secondly, it's just not a healthy thing to do. Uh, just for your basic health, you got to get out there. I love to run. That's kind of my release. It's like go to the, gym if i don't go to the gym then i live in in uh, the Colin ranch area here in reno and so i just run around the hills and that's a nice release for me and then i make sure that my wife and i at least get one date night a week where it's just her and i and uh, we go out and do something i think that's important and then we have four kids and eight grandkids in reno so we're always having them come over asking for money and doing other things so uh that keeps us well in tune with them as well so Jeffrey, how do you handle it a lot of early mornings. Um, so I try to do a lot of the work when the, the family's asleep. So early mornings or late nights. When I come home from work, I try to unplug it as I can, make sure we're doing dinners and, and school work. And I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. And, and we also, so they're getting into sports now too. So that's a new dynamic we're having to juggle. But um, my, my outlet is swimming. So I like to swim in the mornings to help kind of release some of that stress too. And then for the on the picnic business side, when we're setting up a picnic, they can do two. They have two hours to for that picnic, so that forces the family wherever we're at to have two hours together to go uh, check out a new beach at Lake Tahoe or go to a restaurant for lunch or dinner. And so that that's kind of an easy built-in one for that side of the business. But also because there's you know three of them going on, we've had to. <coughs> The picnics were too busy that we either had to scale up and hire and manage that or turn it into a hobby business. Uh, otherwise, life would be about picnics. So we, we've scaled that one back so it's more of a hobby business. And then on the suits, we stopped marketing. So now it's just word of mouth to be able to field those as they come in versus getting too many orders at once. So so those ones are affected, I guess, on a, a financial side negatively, but they I, I create them as a lean startup. So there's no expense until something is ordered so we can scale up or down as we need to maneuver with our our family life must be a busy life and joe how's it going with the dogs and family work balance well I, this is a hard one for me because i get paid to drink <laughs> so <laughs> i've got a pretty good balance going on all day long it's not bad <laughs> Unless you lose your balance. Yeah, my, uh, I mean, my old job was the one where I had to worry about the work-life balance, and then I started a bourbon company, and now it's fantastic. I hang out at bars and liquor stores with people who want to have a good time, and, and uh, I mean, and I work with my wife, you know, day in and day out. My dogs go everywhere. We take them on the road everywhere we go, and they're, you know, most of the time they're sitting on a couch behind me if we're on a call like this, and so I, I'm in a unique and, and wonderful position that I can honestly say that, uh, that my work is just as much recreation on, you know, half the time as it is work. And, uh, but we have, you know, a son and a grandson that we get to play with too. And, uh, but yeah, I, I tell people, I, I wish I'd have started this business a long time ago. It's the most fun I've ever had in, in my work career. So I really can't complain. All right, well, that sounds like a piece of advice for our budding entrepreneurs here. So we'll take that from you. How about you, Jeff? Any advice for our budding entrepreneurs? Um, I would say something that I've learned along the way is launch. The, the project and, and product creep happens so easily, and you always find bugs, and you want to fix it. And, and it's the hard, hard part for me is just launch it. 
get it to a point where it can work and then launch it and then figure it out. What you think might work might not be what the consumers want. And so as you're you're nickeling and diming and fixing and fixing and fixing, you're losing time from the, with the consumer to get awareness as well as as figuring out what the consumer really wants. So that's my if I would give one advice, I would say get it going and launch it. Try it out. And you're reiterating what Danielle was saying earlier to Karsten. Talk to your customers. Find out what they want. And Lieutenant Colonel, a couple sentences for the budding entrepreneurs. I'll make it quick. What Jeff just said is, is absolutely true because one of the hesitations startups have is they want the environment to be perfect, right? They're so worried about being successful. And, and to be successful as a startup, you're going to have failures. And you just got to accept that. But you need to launch. You need to set realistic but yet challenging goals for yourself. And, and the, one of the skill sets you learn is when it doesn't go your way, how you're going to readapt to that. And I think, um, you know, putting those all together is you got to be flexible, but you got to be bold at the same time and get it out there. So go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Just, just go for it. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, are you guys all comfortable with sharing, with our sharing your emails so that the audience can get in touch with you if they wish? <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. And I put my uh, website address on the uh, chat box. So if anyone wants to jump in there and kind of see more about our company and who works there. And if you have resumes, if you're an engineer, mechanical, chemical, bio, uh, starting in the first quarter of next year, we're looking for people. So let there us you know. go. Job opportunities. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen.